Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Dan. Mm. I can just feel the spirit of God in the house this morning. Brother Dan, could you hand me my um, leaf uh, book in the back of there? Got so lost in God's word this morning. <laughs> I forgot I left my, my notes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Not that I need them, but just in case. Oh, God is so good. Oh, I have such, I just want to release this word to you today. Oh, hallelujah. This is such a confirmation after confirmation that I have been getting for this word. And I was ready to release it last week. Hallelujah. So I had to hold on to this for the, the whole week. I had to hold on to this word. Let me tell you something. I'm about to burst right now. God is so good, isn't he? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, for a few weeks now, uh, actually a few weeks ago, Pastor Damaris and I, we did a, uh, a tag team preaching, I guess you could say, a tag team uh, teaching on commitment. And as we were doing this uh, commitment teaching on a Wednesday night, it was on a Wednesday night a couple weeks back, the Lord told me that he wanted me to expand on this message for the church. I mean, it was so resonating in my spirit that I knew. I, it was almost as if I didn't even need a confirmation, but I always get confirmation from the Lord. I will never preach a message until I hear a confirmation from the Lord. But this was the first time that it so resonated in my spirit that I felt I don't even need a confirmation. I know this is what God wants me to preach on. But of course, the confirmations came, and uh, all through the week I've been hearing confirmation. As a matter of fact, even this morning when, uh, before we came out here, uh, Elder Dolores was talking about what was being prayed in the prayer this morning. Another confirmation. It's just like the, the Lord is so good. He knows what he wants for his people. And he knows he, I am, so, that is the one thing that I am so thankful for is that God will always let me know when he, the word that he wants me to preach on. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so the name of my message this morning is reigniting commitment in your life. I love that word, reigniting. Hallelujah. Set it on fire. Hallelujah reigniting commitment to your life. And so the goal for this message this morning is to review the difference between commitment and total commitment. There's a story that goes, most of you may know this, may, maybe not. I just found out about it a couple weeks ago and I thought it was a really cute story. But uh, it's about a pig and a hen. And they're walking down the street one day and they come across this church sign, pretty much like the one we have in the front. And on a church sign it said, what can you do to feed the hungry or to feed the poor. And the hen looks over at the pig and says, you know what, we could do that. We could, we could give them bacon and eggs. <laughs> so the pig looks over at the hen and says, hmm. He goes, you know, that's a great idea. He says, and I agree with you. He said, you can, you can definitely contribute. He said, but for me, I think it's gonna be a total commitment. Right? He's going to have to be a total commitment because he's going to have to die in order to give the bacon. It's a lot like the church is today. A lot of people in the church today, there's a commitment, a partial commitment, but is there a total commitment? Do we die to self like the pig had to die? Do we die to ourselves because we need to feed the lost? Those that are around us, our family, our friends, our workplaces, they need the word of God, but we need to die to self and it has to be a total commitment. Mm. And so this morning, my key verse is found in 1 Kings 8.61, which says, and I'm reading from the NIV, and may your hearts be fully committed, fully committed to the Lord, our God, to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this set time. When I think of total commitment, I think of athletes. You know, the Olympics, every four years we have the Olympics. And we see them go up there and then whatever sport it is they're in, the javelin throw, the, the relays, the whatever, the whatever the sport is that they're playing. And we see them go up there and they win the gold and we say, wow, that was a great event and it was exciting for us and we saw how they won the gold. But then we look at that and we say, what did they have to do in order to get that gold? 
They needed a total commitment to that sport. When those people for the Olympics train, they eat, breathe, and drink that sport, whatever it is that they're doing. That's what they do, that's their life. They get up at four o'clock in the morning, they start their training. They can't eat, they can't just say, well, I'll just have some cookies uh, for lunch today because I did so well for the past couple of weeks. No, they eat and dr everything they do has to be geared right towards that. I remember years ago when I was, uh, uh, I used to be into working out, and I used to follow this guy named, um, Franco Colombo, because him and I had the same body style. Of course, I was bigger than him, but anyway. Uh, but I remember he was friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Arnold Schwarzenegger once said, he said that he had a funeral to go to for, I think it was his father had died. He refused to go to the funeral because of his training. Wow. Now, I don't agree with that, but that's what he did. They, he was totally, totally committed to his sport. And so these past several weeks, I've been preaching out of Kings, as you well know. Uh, God's kind of planted me in there for a while, and he hasn't told me to get out yet, so for a season I'm still in Kings. But we've learned uh, from Kings over the past several weeks, we've learned about how King Solomon and Adonijah, if you remember that, the very first uh, message I preached out of Kings, and we learned on how to hold on to the things of God, God's promises, just like Solomon did. He held on to God's promise that he was going to be king, even though he was 10th in line when it came to being born. And Adonijah was fourth, and he, going by the world, thought that he needed to be the king because that's how it works in the world. But how, do you, how many of you know when, when God says something, it's God's word that goes through. It doesn't matter what the world says or what the world thinks. And so he held on to the promises. Adonijah held on to his pride, and he held on to the world. And and King Solomon had victory. And then we had King Joash that uh, uh, Pastor Damaris had preached on about striking the arrows of victory. And he only struck the arrows of victory three times. He should have done a five or six. And he would have won the, he would have won the battle. He would have won the war. Never mind the battle. He only won the three battles. He could have won the war. He didn't use the arrows that he had. And she was talking about how we need to use our arrows in our quiver, our arrows of faithfulness, our arrows of protection, and our arrows of breakthrough, our arrows of prayer, our arrows of fellowship, our arrows of praise. Hallelujah. And then I spoke on King Jeroboam and how he rejected God's plan for your life. You know, God has a plan for all of us, and he rejected God's plan. He rejected his power, and he rejected his authority, and he rejected the anointing and his protection and privilege and he rejected the legacy he could have had and his inheritance that he could have had. And then the last week, or I should say the week before, I preached on the six different kinds of deception and how the two prophets, uh, the one prophet that came and, and rejected the, the, the religion that Jeroboam was doing and he did the right things, but then another false prophet came and convinced him to turn away and go back on God's word. And the reason why we see all of these things, what we learn is that they could not keep the big if. How many of you remember the big if? 1 Kings 11.38. If you do whatever I command, if you walk in obedience to me, if you do what is right in my eyes, if you obey my decrees and obey my commands, if you obey those things, these things will be added on to you. The Lord, if you follow his ways, if you follow his commands, then you will be successful. And I don't care what you do, and I don't care what you see going on around you, you will have what you ask for because you're doing in the will of God, and God will bless you if, if, if you. Hallelujah. And so as I was work, looking at the book of Kings, and I know the Lord hasn't taken me out of it, I said, who can I find in Kings? There's a few people that you can find in Kings that were good. But I found this one king that really intrigued me, and I said, I, I, I want to preach about this guy. This guy here it was somebody I found who was on fire for God. I mean, he was gun-ho. He did everything God told him to do. He was a fireball out there. And he went out there, and he was, he was doing the things the Lord told him. He was having such good success and everything. You could see it in his life. In fact, God liked this man so much because of what he did that he even gave him four more generations on the throne after him. And not only that, because of that, he, be, he, he, because of that, he was the longest running uh, uh, dynasty 
out of all the kings, even though he was number 11th on the list and there were 20 kings, out of all the kings on the northern side, because this is where he came from, the northern kingdom. Remember, we got the split kingdom, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. He was from the northern kingdom, but he ran the longest dynasty out of all of them because of what he did for the Lord. Hallelujah. And of course, the man that I'm speaking of this morning is Jehu, J-E-H-U. Jehu did, uh, has an amazing story, and I can't wait to jump into it, but I just want to show you what he was up against. I want to show you first, I want to I, I give you a short story, a very short story on Ahab, because what Ahab did affected is why this man was, what this man was up against. Ahab was a very evil king. Uh, 1 Kings 16.33 says that he was the most evil king out of all, you know, all of the kings before him, but that's because he was influenced by his wife Jezebel. Jezebel was a very evil woman. She was the daughter of a king of the Sidonians, but she was a very evil woman, and her and Ahab brought so much evil into that northern kingdom, way more than Jeroboam did. I mean, there was never any Baal worship, but there was then. There was never any, uh, you know, witchcraft or any of that, you know, super intensified idol worship, but it was after he came in and she came in. And so they were doing, the, the, the region was so so infiltrated with evil that it was God even realized that it's time to clean this up. And so he goes in there, and I want you to listen to a prophecy that was prophesied to Ahab, because there's a couple things I want to point out. He says, Ahab says to Elijah, so you have found me my enemy, because they didn't get along too well. Most prophets don't. But he said, uh, but Elijah said, I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. Listen to what he says. He says, I will wipe out your descendants and cut off you from Ahab, every last male in Israel, slave or free. He's going to wipe out his entire family line. And then he says, I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, which is what he did with Jeroboam. And he says, the son of Nebet and that of uh, Basha, the son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. Wipe them out, the whole family line, just like he did with Jeroboam and, and Basha. He did the same thing. And then he says, and also concerning Jezebel, the Lord, the dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Okay? He says, the dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab in the city. And in the, in the, and in the countryside, the birds are going to eat uh, all of his uh, descendants. He says, there was never anyone like Ahab and sold himself to evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. That's why he was so evil. He listened to his wife. <laughs> and all the men said, <laughs> amen. <laughs> behaved, he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. And when Ahab heard these words, when Ahab heard these words, it says that he tore his cloak and he repented. He actually repented for everything that he did. And God honored his repentance. Look at what it says. He says, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, and he said, Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring this disaster in his day, because he was going to bring it in his day. He said, but he did say this. He said, I will, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So here we have all of this evil that's going on. The next king comes in line, king number nine, because Ahab was eight, and he did, they didn't do anything about it. Then comes king number 10. King number 10 is who's king right now. And Jehu is what? Jehu right now is the commander of the army of, uh, of the northern kingdom. He's the commander of the army. And right now he's in Ramah. And right now the, the king that is king right now, which is King Joram. Now Joram got injured and goes back to Jezreel and here comes Jehu. He's sitting there amongst his, his uh, brethren. They're sitting down and they're talking, whatever, conference or whatever. And in comes this, this prophet. And now let's see what the prophet says to him. Okay, this is years later now, right? So the prophet comes up to him and it says this in 2 Kings 9, verses 1 through 13, but I'm going to start at verse 6. Jehu got up and went into the house with this prophet. He just meets this prophet. The prophet comes in and Jehu stands up because this is who the prophet is looking for. And they walk into the house and the prophet pours oil on Jehu's head and declares, this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel says. This is what he says to him. 
I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. Meanwhile, they already have a king. But he had just anointed him king. Guess who's going to be king now? In fact, the whole army was on Jehu's side because there was rumors of, of, of rebellion going around anyway. And so he says, you are to destroy. Listen to what he says. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. And I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebet, and like a house of Beja, son of Ahijah. And as for Jezreel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And then he opened the door and he fled. Sounds familiar, right? We just heard the prophecy over Ahab. He wasn't going to see it in his day, but he was going to see it in his son's day. Well, jo Joram is his son, and he's going to see it in his day. See, he, Ahab did so much, so much evil, he was going to, it was going to be addressed. There was, no, there was no way it wasn't going to be addressed. But because he put on sackcloth and ashes, because he you know, came but humbled himself before the Lord, the Lord had mercy on him. Even in the Old Testament, and he said, okay, you're not going to see it, but your son is going to see it because what you reap, you're, you're sowing. One way or the other, you're going to reap what you sow, Ahab. And so now his son is ruling. His son is king, but he went. He went over to uh, Jezreel because, to heal from his wounds from the battle that was going on over in Ramah. So now here's Jehu in Ramah with his men, and they get up, and look at the things that, that, that Jehu is doing. L look at what he asked, and look at how Jehu followed Oh, hallelujah. So Jehu is a commander. He's a strategist. He understands war, the art of war. He knows how to battle. He knows how to get people together. He knows how to crush the enemy. What, a, what, a, what, what better guy to make king than someone like Ahab? And he was well liked. And here's his amazing story. Praise the Lord. So Jehu was anointed by God, of, by the, by God for king of Israel. He was anointed by God to be king. So he was. He was anointed by God, and they shouted king, and he, they made him king. And he went over to Ramah, and what did he do? The first thing he did after he got anointed by king is he solidified his, his reign by killing the king, Joram. The first one on the list. He plotted, went, and he killed Joram. Then he goes after he does, after he kills uh, Joram, he goes over in 2 Kings 9.30, and he goes to Jezebel's place, Jezebel's palace. And he tells Jezebel she's up on the up, in the, up on the wall in the, in the window, and he tells the people that are up there, they see by now Jezebel has heard that Jehu went wild, went, went AWOL, and he's basically just going out there and, and uh, he's solidifying his kingship. So she knows what's going on. And he's up there and he says, who's with me? And the three people that are around her, they, they look over the edge, they pretty much say, because they can't stand her, they can't stand you know, the, 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 what's going on in, in, their, in their world. And so what does he do? He says, then throw her down. And they throw her down. And she's by the wall. She gets hit. And then uh, ah uh, Je Jehu literally, ride, the, the Bible says this. This isn't me making it up. He rides over her body with the chariots, goes inside and has a meal. And then he tells them to go bury her because she's the daughter of a king. They go out there. There was nothing to bury. The dogs ate her, just like the prophecy said. Everything that prophecy said came to, and look who's, Who's, who's doing the prophecy? Look who's fulfilling the prophecy, Jehu. And I would even submit to you that Jehu knew these prophecies because he was, he was well acquainted with Elisha, who was the prophet at this time. Elijah didn't see it happen, but Elisha did. Hallelujah. And so Jehab goes and he kills, he goes on to uh, Samaria and uh, well, he, he sends a letter out and he has the sons the sons of Ahab, 70 sons Ahab had, and he had them all killed. Then he went, and he, uh, in, in 1017, he came to Samaria, and he killed all who remained in, to Ahab in Samaria until he had destroyed them according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. You see, so Ahab did. He wiped out the entire family line, just like he was prophesied to do. And so now he's got one more piece of business. Jezebel's gone, but they still have Baal worship. Do you know that that Jehu single-handedly wiped out Baal worship in uh, Samaria. How did he do it? He went, actually, he, he put out a word. He said to everybody, oh, I want all of the priests to come together. They all went into the Temple of Baal, which, by the way, Ahab built with Jezebel. They go into the Temple of Baal. He gets every priest from the area, for the whole region, 
pretending they're going to have this big sacrifice, this big ceremony. He gets them all inside. When he gets in there, he surrounds them with 80 of his guards, with 80 of his men, and, he, and they go in there and they worship. And he says, when they're all done, I want to go in there and kill every one of them, effectively wiping out Baal worship completely. And then he goes in and he takes the, he destroys the, the temple. He burns up the wooden images. And you know what they put up in its place of the temple? A latrine. That's a bathroom. That's a toilet. It's amazing, you know. It, it, it's, but he had single-handedly wiped out Baal worship. There was no more Baal worship in there. Look at what this guy is doing. This guy is amazing in what he's doing. It just it blows your mind. If you could just... If you could just picture with this guy, he is so on fire for God, and he is so committed. As a matter of fact, in uh, 2 Kings 10, 16, he says this. He's, he, he meets up with his fr a friend, and uh, his, his friend is, let's see if I can pronounce this, uh, his friend's name, Jehonadab, Jehonadab. He meets up with Jehonadab. He's, you know, you a friend. He grabs his hand. He pulls him up, and he goes this. He says these words. He says, see my zeal for the Lord. See my zeal for the Lord. This guy is going out. He's conquering kings. He's, he's conquering Jezebel. He's tearing down Baal worship. He's going out there. He's doing the right thing. He's going in the right direction. It's amazing like how this guy is just literally cleaning up the northern. Finally, finally, they have a king on the northern side that's for God. He's doing what he told him to do. He's standing for 1 Kings 11.38. He's doing what God told him. He's doing what's right in God's eyes, and God sees this, and he's going in the right direction. It is awesome that this guy is doing something that is needed to be done in that area. He's cleaning house. Oh, hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. Look at what this man is doing. He was headed for greatness, cleaning house in Israel. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He had the qualities and he had the characteristics of a good king. He had good military planning capabilities. He was a strategist. He was a role model for successful kings. He was chosen by God and honored by the people. He was anointed to be king. Jehu defeated his enemies, Ahab, uh, Baal worship, Jezebel, witchcraft, uh, the, all of that stuff. He was wiping it all out. He was cleaning house. I mean, it was amazing what he was doing. His dynasty, as I said before, was the longest lasting dynasty because of what he did for God. Oh, hallelujah, the longest dynasty. He had the Excuse big me. C. Excuse me. The big C. Excuse yes. me. I, I'm, I have a message to give to Jehu. Okay. Do you know where Jehu lives? Oh, yeah, Jehu's right over there beyond that door. He oh, over, over there? there. Is, yeah, it, yeah. is it like over by Jerusalem or Samaria? Do I go it's down the mountain? It's actually Samaria, yeah. But, the uh, mountain? Oh, go down oh, the mountain? Yes, it's down the mountain oh, to the okay. right. Do I pass like the river? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, but I just want to say thank you. You know, I, you're the big C, right? Yeah, I'm oh, the big C. Great. Hey, God. see? I'm the, the big, big C. C. Commitment. Yay. That's what we're talking about this morning, right? Commitment. Look at what he's done. Jehu committed himself. Sir? He did the things that the Lord told him Sir? to do. He was on point with everything Sir? he did. Yes. My yes. name is not commitment. What is your name? My name is Compromise. Compromise? Yes, my name is Compromise. And no, I have something no, no. to tell Jehu. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, no, no. I have to tell Jehu. No, Jehu's not in right now. Well, I have to show him about Compromise. Oh, okay. well, well, and I'm going to go to see Jehu. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Did, did I say Jehu went that way? Yeah, you no, said no, no. that he's down the river. No, I'm thinking of somebody else. Somebody oh. looks like him. I keep, oh, oh, I always okay. think he's got, So he doesn't live down he's there? He's really through that door. If you go oh, through that door. Oh, he's through here? Go down to, okay, I have to talk to him about Compromise. Okay, yeah, so you, you just that go way? down, yeah, make a left at 495, okay. uh, go that east, take right. that right over to okay. GW Bridge, you'll I'll find go. him. I'll go, all right. I think he's in Fort Lee. <laughs> Can you imagine Jehu, what he's, oh, he did such amazing things, and then Compromise tries to come in, but we're not going to let Compromise get him, no way. Compromise will not get a hold of him because, I mean, look at what verse 28 says in verse 28. He says, then they broke down the sacred pillar in Baal and tore down the temple of Baal and made it into a dump to this day. And then verse 28, thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. He destroyed Baal from Israel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God is so good, God is so good. Thank God he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get compromised. Oh, praise the Lord. But wait, what? Uh, okay, the ending. Uh, wait, I thought that was the ending. Oh, there's another verse. There's verse 29. Oh, no, 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 verse 29. No, he, he didn't do verse 29. We can't have... No! Verse 20... Not compromise! 
How did she get over there? How did compromise get passed? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Verse 29, no, verse 29 didn't happen. We don't want verse 29 to happen, folks. You don't want verse 29 in your life. It's bad. It's bad. That's compromise. Let me read to you verse 29. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, who had made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. What happened? Oh, what happened? You see, he allowed something familiar in his life, and he couldn't let it go. If he could have just let that go, he was going in the right direction. He was headed the way God wanted him to go. He was cleaning house. He was doing an awesome job, but for whatever reason, he couldn't let go of that worship to the golden calf. He felt that that really was God, that he was speaking through that calf. Sometimes we hold on to compromise in our lives and we don't realize it. Sometimes there are things that we're doing in life that's a compromise. What is it that's familiar in your life that you can't seem to get away from? You know it's not God's way. You know it, God doesn't want you in that area. It's called compromise. It's called compromise. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. 2 Kings 10.31 compromise he was he was a hen he was there he was doing the right thing he was on fire for God he was going in the right direction but he's still a hen he's still a hen because he didn't totally commit himself to the God he partially committed he got really close but he didn't give his total heart you know in Revelation God talks about how you have one foot in the world and you have one foot in the word and he says, get it out of one or the other. Either be totally hot and on fire for me, or go and be cold because you're doing me no good. I spew you out because I can't use you. If you're half in the world and half in the word, God says either get out of it and go your way, or get, in, get hot and follow me. Praise the Lord. So who does Jehu have to blame? Who can blame Jehu for what he did? What not that he did, what Jehu did, who's going to blame? Well, it, it could have been, we, we could point the fingers to a lot of people. We could point the fingers uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the golden calves. We can point the fingers to Ahab. We can point the fingers to the, his predecessors. We can point the fingers just to, to anybody. But who's ultimately responsible? It's not God's fault. It's Jehu's fault. Jehu is responsible. Jehu is... Re in uh, in uh, Job 19.4, it says, If it is true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. Job saying, he says that if I've erred, it's on me. It's not on anybody else because I did what I thought was right. I was back into my familiarity. And he says, and uh, the NLT says it this way, he says, Even if I have sinned, that is my concern, not yours. Job is saying, he says, if I sinned, it's me that did it. Nobody else. I can't point the fingers at anyone around me. We can't blame others for our actions. The lack of commitment was by Jehu. Jehu did well in the beginning, but in the end, he lacked total commitment. His heart was not totally God's. He was committed for a time. He compromised. He allowed what was familiar to stay in his life. It controlled him. He did not keep the commands of God. He was so close, but, the, but he lost his opportunity because of the big if. Again, the big if. Mm. He did not try to remove the generational idols that were in his life that kept him bound. If he would have kept the commands of God, if he would have just followed God's plan, he could have had it all. He was going there. He could have had every, everything that God promised Jeroboam, remember? He could have had. Any one of those kings could have had it. But he came the closest. And because of what he did for God, God did give him four generations to follow the throne after him. Gave him the longest dynasty. God did give him that. But that was it. In the end... He was a bad king. He was a good king, going in the right direction, but he couldn't get rid of his compromise. So I come back to my verse in 1 Kings 8, 61. It says, And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God, to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. 
Jesus is a good example where the church is at today. Uh, Jehu, I'm sorry, is a good example of where the church is at today. Jehu is a good example of where a lot of the church is today. People are not fully committed. They're partially committed. But when they go out in the world, are they living like Jesus wants us to live? I'm not saying we've got to join a monastery or anything. But is your life a godly life? You know, we're so concerned about what people are going to tell us, and they're going to say, oh, you're one of those religious fanatics, and you, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm religious. You know, oh, you must be self-righteous. Yeah, I'm self-righteous, thank you. I'm not, you know, I'm a righteous person. You are, you're a righteous person. We are. When you're a born-again believer, you are righteous. That's, that's who you are. So don't let it offend you. Thank them. Thank them, yeah, that's right, I am righteous. You could be too if you want to. We need to understand that we have to walk in the things of the Lord fully. We need to be fully fully committed. Church, this day and age that we're in right now is so imperative that we walk in the things of God fully. We have to be totally committed to Him. And I guarantee you, when you totally commit yourself to God, I guarantee you, you will not only kick the enemy, you will not only beat every bad thing that's going on in your life because you will the enemy will make you think you're not winning but you will as long as you stick to the plan if you do the what if if you continue to do 1138 and do what god tells you to do i don't care how bad it looks around you i don't care what people are saying i don't care the way it looks you can be in the middle of a volcano if god says you're going to survive you're going to survive and that's it and that's what we have to get that mindset in you get that mindset of i don't care what you say i don't care what i see god told me otherwise and I will stick to his promise and I will stick to his word. And if he told me to walk through that fire, I will walk through that fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. So be fully committed. Fully committed to your spiritual zeal and passion. Like Jehu had that zeal and passion for Jesus. I'm for God. Well, for the Lord, right? He had that zeal for him. We need to hold on to that zeal. Be excited about it. Fully committed to your first love, Jesus. Be fully committed. Remember when you first gave your heart to Jesus, man, you were telling everybody about him. But we let the compromise of the world kind of get in between us and, and we start falling. back. And the church is such an apostate church today. So many people are falling away from the Lord. Why? That's what the enemy wants. But that's changing. That's changing, and you mark my words, there is going to be such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I'm telling you, it's coming fast and furious, and it's coming very quickly. Don't think that this isn't going to happen. God is fed up, is fed up with Ahab, and right now, he's for Jesus, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Mark my words. This church is going to be packed out with people that need help. And we're going to be here to, really, to bring them in and to minister to their hearts. And they're going to know who Jesus is. They're going to know there's a different, there's a, there's a better life. Be fully committed to others. Be fully committed in your relationships with your wife and your kids. Be fully committed to them. If you do what's right in God's eyes, you will have victory after victory over your kids, over your marriage, over any area in your life. You will have victory because of the big what if. Fully committed to living a righteous life. Live a righteous life. Man, don't, be, don't shy away from it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't, don't, I don't care what people say about it. Live a righteous life, man. I want to live a righteous life. That's what I'm trying to do. We can live a righteous life. We can. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but I am saying that you can live it. And I am saying that as long as you're in God's will, as long as you are following God's word, no matter what happens, you will have success. Amen. Hallelujah. Fully committed, not compromising. Enough with compromising. We've compromised enough in the world today. Everything is being compromised. We need to be fully committed to not compromising to the things that we're used to, knowing full well that this is not our, our plan for God's life. We want to follow God's plan for our life. He created this world. He created you. He created me. So stands to reason to me that he knows how it works. And if he knows how it works, he gave us the instructions to teach us how it works. And so as long as we follow his instructions and we don't throw them out like some of us guys do, right? When we're building something for our kids and we just throw the instructions out, who needs instructions? That's what the world does. They say, who needs instructions? I can do it on my own. Yeah, God, God likes to laugh too. Hallelujah. Fully committed. Be fully committed, enduring until the end. Don't give up. Church, that's, that's, that's my biggest, right here. If you get nothing else from today's message, don't give up. 
Keep on trying, keep on pushing forward. Don't look behind you, push to the things forward, the things ahead of you. Don't put your hands on the plow and don't look back. Fully committed to the things that please God. What are the things that please God? Worship, prayer, the word. Hallelujah. Total and full commitment. We must commit ourselves to the Lord. We will he will establish our plans. If we submit ourselves to the Lord, he will establish our plans. Man's plans will fail otherwise, but God, God is our source. He made everything. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Whatever you're doing in life, whatever your talent is, commit it to the Lord. He'll make it work. Amen. Amen. He put the desires in your heart. Those desires he put there so that you could use those for the works of the Lord. So that you could use those to witness to those that are around you. That's why he gave you those desires. He wants you to have those desires. Say, oh, I shouldn't be doing that because it's, it's too good. No, it's, God gave that to you. He gave that to you for a reason because he knows he can use you in areas around you. And so he gives us special talents and abilities. Amen. So let me ask you, church, are you fully committed? Are you ready to fight for your right as a child of God? Do you know how to use the secret weapon? God has given us secret weapons. Do you know how to use the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost is in each and every one of us, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Today, the Holy Spirit was in this house, and he was healing people as they were sitting there in your chairs. People are being healed. I know there are being people being healed right now in the name of Jesus. The Spirit of God is in here, and I know that he is healing you right now because God God's word never falls. It always accomplishes that for which it was sent. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you have faith of a mustard seed? Because if you have faith of a mustard seed, let me tell you how powerful you are. You can say, hey, I have the faith of a mustard seed and I know how to use it. And you do. You know how to use it. Just the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. It can tell it to go into the ocean and it will have to obey. And when the enemy comes at you at night or when you get a dream of the enemy trying to come at you, all you need to say is one word, Jesus. And that enemy will flee. He has no option. He has nothing else he can do. He has to obey the word of the Lord. That's the power that you have in Christ Jesus because of the spirit of God that's within you. Oh, hallelujah, church, we need to know who we are. We need to know who we are in Christ. Hallelujah. And praise is a good one. That's one of my favorite ones. Praise, praise can break compromise. Praise can break bondage. Praise can break addictions. Praise can break depression. Praise can break anger. Praise can break double-mindedness. Praise can break it. Praise can break it. So if we just get into our praise, if we go in before the Lord and we just praise the Lord and we just sing hallelujah, I don't care if you're in your car. I don't care if you're in your bedroom. I don't care if you're in the middle of Times Square. If you start praising God, hallelujah, the Spirit comes alive in you. Let's praise Him, church. Let's praise. Let's praise Jesus. Hallelujah. He has all authority. All authority. Hallelujah. Oh, God is good all the time. Hallelujah. Praise God. You have power, church. You have power. You know the power that you have. Hallelujah. You have power in Christ. You have power in Jesus. He's given it to you. He's given it to you. It's a gift. It's free. Hallelujah. Oh, thank them. Thank them for everything. Thank them for your gifts. Thank them for the press. Thank him for everything. Hallelujah. Oh, God is so good. And this morning, I want to open up. Hallelujah. Praise oh, hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. I want to open the altars this morning. If there's anyone that wants to come up just to do, just to recommit themselves to the Lord, please, these altars are going to be open. If you want to just come up and, and you want to just for anything, anything you want to put, we're here to pray. We're here to pray for you. We'll pray for whatever it is that's going on in your life. We can pray for you for the commitment back to God to re reestablish it, reignite the fire in the name of Jesus. Reignite it, reignite it. The altars are open. If you want to come up and give your heart to Jesus, come on up and give your heart to the Lord. Whatever you need prayer for, I'm opening up these altars and I'm saying, come, come to the front, come to the altar. Oh, hallelujah.